Antoinette, we are good. <clears throat> Antoinette, you're muted, but we are ready to go. We're live. Hey folks, thank you for joining JJC Talks. My name is Dave Issa. I'm the manager of community engagement here at the BMA. Um, I wanted to quickly introduce to you the amazing Antoinette Peel, who is the chair of the Joshua Johnson Council, um, who is responsible for the programming this evening. Antoinette. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Joshua Johnson Council Talks, where we're going to be talking this evening with the wonderful Crystal Mack. Joshua Johnson Council is one of the oldest African-American group arts groups affiliated with the museum in the nation, some 36 years old now. So one of the reasons the organization was started was to bridge the gap between the Black community and the arts institution. And that's what they've been pretty good at, making sure that people are coming into the museum since then. We've also wanted to have some influence over the types of programming and art in the museum that looked and reflected the community itself. And now we've engaged with the local artist community, actually bringing them in, something that JJC has been doing for quite a long time, actually having artists come and speak to us on our Thursday meetings. Yes, we do meet every second Thursday of the month at 6 p.m., usually in the museum, but now we're doing it on Zoom, which gives it and opens, it up to, opens us up to a much wider audience. So part of the, one of the most important things we want to be able to do is to let people know that we've got some great artists here in Baltimore. And the way to do that is to check into what we're doing here at JJC on our JJC talks this evening. So it is a membership organization. You have to have a BMA membership in order to join the Joshua Johnson Council. You can do all that at artbma.org slash join, give membership. Do that if you can. So I will turn it back over today, today to introduce the lovely Crystal Mack. So folks, like Antoinette was saying, um, JJC Talks um, is now a public facing event. It is uh, our fall and spring speaker series, um, but this isn't something that is brand new to us. This is how JJC has been operating for years. Um, so the best thing that it's, that has happened from this pandemic is that we've now been able to bring our meetings to you every every month. Um, throughout the fall, we heard first from uh, the photographer Shan Wallace and curator Jessica Bell Brown, Tommy Mitchell and Jarrell Gibbs. Uh, our spring series is looking to be an incredible lineup. And tonight we are super pleased and proud to have the force of nature Crystal Mack with us. Uh, if you know Crystal, if you're here in Baltimore, um, you know that her perspective, her influence, uh, her work is so vital and critical to the creative ecology in the city. Uh, I've been blessed personally to work with her on plenty of projects and to call her a friend, um, but she is, she is doing it here in Baltimore and beyond. Um, so we're, we're happy to have her tonight. I want to also just drop her bio because there's some things on here and things that she has been doing that are amazing. Uh, She's an advocate, an organizer, a cook, an artist based in her hometown of Baltimore. She approaches comestibles, their creation, and experiences centered on them as tools for social change. Viewing through, through the lenses of social science and healing allows Crystal to juxtapose cultural exchange and storytelling with systematic power and oppression, self-care with blind self-destruction, and womanism with feminism. She was named a woman to watch by the Baltimore Sun and listed as a food industry change agent on Cherry Bomb Magazine's 100 Women in Food list. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, Food and Wine, and NPR. Uh, and now is the, the point in the night where it's my job to uh, pass the mic, shut up, and, and hear from the amazing Crystal. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Thank you, JJC, for having me. It's an honor to be here with you all this evening. Um, I'm going to share my screen so we can hop into this presentation. And there we go. Let's make that big. And oop, hold on one second, y'all. There we go. 
So hello, <laughs> and thank you for having me. As I said before, um, uh, my name is Crystal Mack, and I'm just going to start off with a little bit about what I do. As Dave mentioned, I work with comestibles, which are food items. Um, I'm born and raised here in Baltimore. I grew up spending my time between Northwood and Essex. Um, I'm a self-taught chef and artist, and my work focuses on exploring the overlooked connections that we have as humans to food and how those connections can tell us a lot about who we are and where we're going. Um, and the work I create is heavily influenced by my Baltimore upbringing, the cultural work of Black women, past and present, and my own lived experiences. Um, I wanted to start this presentation with a quote from one of my heroes, the legendary Intozaki Shange. Um, and she has said, it is possible to begin a phrase with a word and end with a gesture. And I feel that is very much what my practice is rooted in. That is a guiding force of my practice um, in the way that I engage with food. Um, I believe that it is possible to start work with an emotion, with poetry, with an experience, and, and with the gesture of um, a shared experience through food, whether that's a meal or an intervention or some type of performance. And, and Sosaki Shange and many other Black women before me have been doing the work that I do for quite some time, very much interdisciplinary work that is rooted in food and human connection. Um, these women, all of the women featured, they were known for uh, many things, but one of their key parts of their practices was food. Folks like Ntozake Shange and Maya Angelou, you know, they were known for their writing, but they were also amazing cooks. Um, so each of these women listed, um, unfortunately, only one is still with us. One of the sisters, um, Norma Jean and Carol Darden, of spoon bread and strawberry wine is only still with us today. But all of these women have blazed the trail for the work that I do today. Um, it is the cultural work of black women that has brought me where I am. So how I started in food was as an entrepreneur. Um, I had three food concepts in Baltimore from the period of 2015, 2014 to 2017. Uh, the first of those being a fruit and vegetable um, mid-Atlantic seasonality based frozen dessert concept called Karma Pop. And with this uh, business, I worked with urban farms and rural farms to source ingredients and turn them into frozen desserts. Um, this was a tricycle based business. So I rode around Baltimore selling my ice pops and my sorbets and it was crowdfunded and uh, through Kickstarter and I raised over $7,000 to purchase that tricycle that I'm sitting on. And it was a three speed, 140 pounds. And in the fall and winter, I would sell pies and it was called the pie cycle. Um, so I would sell my pies and my baked goods around the city at different cafes. And um, eventually I got the attention of a developer and it's actually the development company that is redeveloping Lexington Market, Seawall. And they approached me about being a part of their first food hall that they had created called Our House in Remington. So this was my opportunity to have a brick and mortar location. Um, and this is pretty much the business that kind of put me at the forefront of people's attention, both locally and nationally. It was called Black Sugar. And for me, Black Sugar was meant to um, pretty much showcase the um, ways that Black women have always played a role in food. Um, with a little bit more of a contemporary fun twist as far as ingredients, as you can see, very vibrant and colorful. <laughs> um, there were a few negative experiences, however, that I had in my relationship with this development company that led me to feel very tokenized um, and used and exploited. So for that reason, I decided to leave and close my bakery um, and pretty much leave the food industry as an entrepreneur. Um, just from that experience, as far as being positioned as a product uh, to help make someone else more money and also feeling as though I was essentially sharecropping in that space when it came to rent and the creation of my work. I was making enough to seemingly do well, but just get by. There was not ever a return just because of the rates of rent up against me. Um, 
So with that being said, I decided to leave and reevaluate my relationship with food and think about the ways that uh, food can be seen as more than just an item for consumption. Um, so that's what brings me to this image here, this graphic here. This is by Neri Oxman, and she is a professor at MIT. And she has this really beautiful uh, illustration or diagram, excuse me, called Crab Cycle of Creativity. And in this diagram, she showcases the four modalities of human creativity, which are science, engineering, design, and art. And she shows how one also influences the other. They are all influencing each other constantly. Um, so she says that science converts information around us into technology. Um, engineering converts knowledge into utility. Design converts utility into cultural behavior and context. And then art takes that cultural behavior and questions our perception of the world. So it's kind of a flow of information, a flow of creativity that happens across all of these disciplines. Um, so if you were to view this as a clock, which she does, at 12 o'clock, if all of that information flows properly, at 12 o'clock, she says that's the Cinderella moment. And that is when new perception inspires scientific exploration and where Picasso meets Einstein and art meets science. And this, seeing this, um, this speaks to me very much. It speaks through my practice very much. Um, my, my work with food is not just based in uh, consumption as it was with my food businesses prior. Um, it's very much interdisciplinary. It's very much about engaging the community and challenging them to think about the ways that food shapes our future. Um, so I'm gonna talk about all of the different types of work that I do with my practice. Uh, the first being comestible design. So this portion of my practice uses food as a vehicle for storytelling, healing, reflection. Um, and this work often takes the form of immersive dinners, experimental eating, artistically designed grazing tables that I like to call tablescapes. And those tablescapes are actually heavily inspired by my love of B. Smith, <laughs> the late B. Smith. She was a consummate host and designer when it came to food experiences. So the tablescapes that you will see um, were very much influenced by her eye that she had and the eye of many black women before me, especially my mom. So shout out to you, mommy, because I know you're watching. <laughs> uh, so the first piece is called the Table of White Supremacy. This is one of my first tablescapes. Um, and this centered around the question, does true dismantling come from within a system of oppression or from those who break free of it to build their own table? Um, there's a very popular quote by Shirley Chisholm. If there's not a seat at the table, you bring a chair and pull it up. But in my mind, as someone today, I wouldn't want to sit at a table that does not want me. I would rather, much rather build a table that is more welcoming and accommodating to myself, my people, um, and the communities that I would like to be a part of. So that is what kind of inspired this piece. And it also was inspired by the ways that all of us, regardless of how we identify, are knowingly or unknowingly complicit when it comes to supporting a system that thrives on our oppression and our want of a seat at the table. So each element on this table represents a byproduct of um, white supremacy and patriarchy. So for example, the desserts uh, were representative of sexual, financial, physical, and emotional abuse. The centerpiece is a cotton centerpiece um, and it symbolizes the significant amounts of wealth originated from the system of slavery, which ensured the wealth and social position of whites for generations to come. And one of the items on the table was also tacos. And these tacos symbolize the false promise of opportunity and acceptance, cultural extraction, and our toxic immigration system. Um, so I gave this talk and presented this work at open hours at the BMA, actually. Um, and it was a really beautiful day, lovely event. And at the end, we all ate because that is how most of my pieces go. Um, this is work that you can experience, um, engage with, and actually consume. Um, so the work lives within you at the end, oftentimes. And this is usually a point of pride for me with my work, seeing people from all different backgrounds and ages coming together and um, having conversations around the issues that we just addressed in the work, um, the social issues that I bring up in the presentations. 
Um, another dinner that, or another dining experience that I created was clearing the field. And clearing the field is a body of work that is still continuously going and it will continue to go until I feel fully transformed by it. So clearing the field, it was an 18 course food-based response to the process of healing personal and generational trauma within my family. Um, so the title of this work, Clearing the Field, is inspired by the agricultural practice of control burning. And control burning is a method that farmers use to prepare their land for healing, essentially. So they set their crops on fire at the end of the season and the fire and ash heals the soil, um, fertilizes the soil, heals the land, gets rid of any pests, um, mites that are, I guess, essentially harming uh, the soil that could lead to the degradation of crops going forward in the next cycle. And this was a dinner that I created in Marble House Projects in Dorset, Vermont, which, Vermont, which is an artist residency um, that I did last year. So this entire dinner, as I mentioned, was 18 courses. Um, it was an 18 course dinner for 24 people that I prepared by myself. Um, it was coal fire cooked and I cooked everything in a coal fire to symbolize the actual process of control burning. Um, and again, the symbolization of like coming through the fire, being renewed by the ash. Um, this was me preparing the fire and I will clip through and let you guys see some of the courses that we had here. You'll see that um, black is a, a big part of this meal. A lot of the black in the meal or all of the black in the meal is either essentially from charring um, the vegetables or incorporating activated charcoal uh, into the food product. So for example, this cocktail that you see here, I tried to drink it away, is a activated charcoal margarita, um, which as a dietary supplement, activated charcoal actually detoxifies the body, but also as a side effect, it does make items turn black. And with this cheese course, I can still taste the past. It is a smoked garlic cheese, um, goat cheese, and this uh, black ash on the top is a um, charred green onion. So green onion ashes on top of this. Um, and I can still taste the past. It's kind of uh, the feeling of lingering uh, trauma, lingering pain that we may experience. And we still sometimes can feel that it's so real and present with us in the current moment. So that is what this course was a nod to. Um, more here, these were the main courses, Adam's Rib and This Is Me Then, which were three different types of uh, coal fire cooked quail. Um, and anointing, this was a bread course with activated charcoal, flatbread and a garlic herb oil for dipping. And Ancestral Path, Ancestral Path was a really cool course in this uh, dinner. It was inspired by um, some articles that I read around um, the Soma and uh, traumatic processing or processing of trauma and also understanding um, that gene alteration apparently. So there's been a lot of research lately that says that um, trauma can kind of become embedded in our genes and it can alter the DNA of our offspring. And I wanted to symbolize this through cooking eggs on um, the coals and ashes from the fire. So these are eggs from the farm at Marble House that I cooked in ashes, hot ashes, um, to kind of ask the question, does the healing that I have and the trauma that I have, so does the trauma that I have get transferred over to my offspring, in this case, the egg? Um, and does the healing that takes place, which is symbolized by this fire, um, does that also take, uh, take hold of my offspring? Does that also transfer over to them? Um, and the end result was yes, either way, <laughs> whether we know it or not, um, those experiences of healing can, you know, either prevent our children from going through any traumatic experiences that they either may witness us going through in the process if we do not choose to heal, um, or that healing that we have can prevent them uh, from going through any tra trauma that could be related to something that we experience. 
uh, a, tale, a Tale of Two Cities. So this is a tablescape that I created earlier this year, actually, in January, when I was at a residency, a research residency in Oaxaca, Mexico. Um, so a Tale of Two Cities was essentially an improvised, excuse me, an improvisational work. Um, I was not planning to make any work at this residency. It was, as I mentioned, a research residency. So I was mostly focusing on doing a lot of writing, um, going to libraries there. And at the end of the residency, when it came time to show work, I was like, no, I've actually been kind of moved by my time here. And the thing that moved me most was the um, public markets that were in Oaxaca. The public markets in Oaxaca were very much similar to the public markets in Baltimore, specifically Lexington Market. Um, I found myself um, almost in tears in the market, just seeing how people in Oaxaca had truly embraced their food ways. Um, and they were so, um, I wouldn't say, well, yeah, they were so rely on and uh, supportive of each other. It truly felt like a community marketplace. And then when I stopped to think about the ways that, you know, that has kind of fallen to the wayside in spaces like Lexington Market, my heart somewhat broke. Um, but I did see genuine connections in the uh, communities that I've seen interact in Lexington Market and then the communities that I saw interact in Oaxaca at the Mercados there. So this tablescape is essentially just um, an offerenda, which is a, a Mexican altar of sorts to the people of Oaxaca and then also to my experience in Baltimore. Um, so I very last minute in one day, ran around Oaxaca City, gathering all of these items, frying chicken, going to a farm, getting chicken from a farm, um, having them get it together for me and um, preparing this table. It was very interesting frying chicken in Oaxaca <laughs> and getting all the ingredients that I needed. Um, the fried chicken was essentially a nod to chicken boxes. You know, there were no fried chicken spots, surprisingly. In my mind, I thought it would be fried chicken. They had every other American delicacy there. They had pizza and all these other things but there was no fried chicken place in Oaxaca. So um, it felt good to have that moment of cultural exchange with people because people in the community did come and see our work. Um, so they got to have fried chicken made with love and care. But I also got to showcase the elements of um, Oaxacan culture that were also rooted in colonialism um, as far as pastries and baked goods and um, Oaxacan cheese with Oaxacan honey that had real bees in it. Um, everything about the, the markets there and the markets in Baltimore and what they were and what they could potentially be um, in the future was really what inspired this work here. And at the end, as always, um, people did eat and consume everything that was that is on this table from uh, the chapolines, which are grasshoppers to the chicken, the mezcal, everything. Uh, interventions are also another part of my practice. So with this portion of my work, um, I create experiences to make the public aware of what I like to call comestible connections that are not traditionally visible to them as everyday consumers. So uh, my most recent intervention was called a communion and it took place in Lexington Market at the BMA Outpost, another BMA <laughs> event, um, but it was a public intervention honoring the foodways and historic markets of Baltimore City. So in this work, participants recommitted themselves to Baltimore City through the spoken word and by eating and drinking the body and essence of Baltimore. So in this regard, Cotty's saltine wafers that I made and half and half. Um, so for me, Lexington Market is a special place because I used to go there after church with my family um, and we would get chicken boxes. But I didn't want to make fried chicken because I know there were people in the market already doing that. Um, and I also wanted to make something that was portable, easy to handle, um, could kind of be held like a communion wafer. And that ended up being Cotty's. So I have my half and half here, my Cotty's here. And we had people come and pay their respects to the city. And this was important to me because, you know, Lexington Market is going through a change right now. And we don't know, and even some of the vendors don't even know whether or not they will be a part of this new Lexington Market. 
um, gentrification is a very real thing. It is changing our city every day, every, every month. It looks different every year. It looks different. Um, and to know that something that has been a constant, even though there are heartbreaking elements to this space, um, it's something that's been a constant in my life and many other Baltimoreans lives. And to know that your future family or your, your children or whomever may not necessarily experience this in the way that you've experienced it. Um, it is somewhat heartbreaking. So this whole intervention was meant to thank Baltimore and the spaces like Lexington Market for what it's been to us and what it could be for us um, in the future going forward. Mm -hmm. So that's my friend, the lovely Felicia G, who I believe was also a JJC speaker. She came and helped me with this piece. Um, and we all recited the, the prayer that I wrote. And then we began communion service. And it was really beautiful. Um, I do feel that the space felt a little bit lighter after, after this um, intervention. And we had Cotties. We also had uh, lemon sticks for folks who couldn't have meat for the vegans out there. We didn't want to keep anyone away. So I had that as well for them. Um, another element of my work is curation and programming. So this work allows me to spotlight and publicly celebrate other creatives and artists in the community that have inspired my practice, but it also allows me to um, work with people and also show folks the ways that food is not just something you go get in a restaurant or food is not something that you just pick up in the grocery store or get from the farmer's market. It's so much more than that. Um, so really trying to take an interdisciplinary approach. Um, Black Women Food and Power. So Black Women Food and Power was the evening at the Walters Art Museum honoring Sibby Grant, who was uh, the enslaved cook of One West Mount Vernon Place um, in the 1800s. So at this event, I debuted a site-specific work, Herf and Home. Uh, and my friend, Gabrielle Carter, filmmaker and farmer, she shared her creative practice. And Dr. Psyche Williams Forson, author of Building Houses Out of Chicken Legs, Black Women, Food and Power, shared the histories and potential futures of Black women in food and hospitality. Um, and the evening was closed out with a toast to Sibby Grant by legendary local sommelier, Nicole Rodriguez, another Black woman in food and beverage. And it was just a really beautiful evening. This is the piece, Hearth and Home, that I installed in the space. Um, and that's Dr. Psyche. And it was just really lovely to commune with people over uh, the invisible labor of this woman um, and celebrate her. He also did Voyage, um, a food journey of the African diaspora. So this was a tasting event inspired by the history and culture of West Africa, the Caribbean, and the low country of the Southern United States. Um, I was contacted by the BMA uh, to curate this experience, and it was during the opening of the exhibit Generations, a History of Black Abstract Art. Um, this is a really special day for me. I, I, I felt very honored to be a part of this and to even be asked as someone who is not formally trained, who barely graduated high school. And I feel like this is important to say because I think there are young people out there watching. I was not the perfect child. Despite being uh, the child of two educators, um, I was expelled from high school. I got in a lot of fights. I was doing all kinds of bad stuff, did not complete college, barely finished a, a first semester of community college and somehow find my way along the way. So to be asked by institutions, um, larger institutions in the arts to curate experiences, um, it is truly a Baltimore girl's dream. <laughs> so thank you very much um, to anyone uh, at any of these institutions that have supported my work. It means a lot to me. And I think it shows that, you know, an art practice is really what you make it. So I just wanna add that in here and say that it is important to show that, you know, while formal training is important and does give you a strong background and critical thinking skills, um, if you have a natural fire within you and a natural drive and a natural skill, it can, it can be cultivated with the right people having your back. And this piece uh, was created to promote the event. 
So this is a life in three acts. To the right, this is a food piece that I created. And to the left is Black Monolith Acts, the birth of Muhammad Ali by the late Jack Whitten. Um, this was a piece that was in the Generation Show. Um, this is a photograph that I took when I went to go visit and do some research. Uh, but A Life in Three Acts to the right, the work that I created, was a dish that was meant to mimic Witten's tesserae technique. Now, the tesserae are these tiles that he uses or he used to create these works. Um, and he said it was a three-part process that it required the construction of these tiles, then deconstructing them and reconstructing them and assembling them into the work. So A Life in Three Acts mimics that in its process. Um, what you see on this dish are black rice crackers with a black garlic aioli. And that black garlic is garlic that has been fermenting for 30 to 45 days that I fermented myself. Um, it then becomes black in color. And then I processed it into a aioli to put on these crackers. These crackers, as I mentioned, are black rice crackers that are created in three parts, just like Witten's tesserae. So the construction element is the cooking of the rice, the boiling of the rice, bringing it to its commonly seen um, presentation of rice. But again, in this case, it is black. Then the deconstruction is uh, taking this cooked rice and um, seasoning spices, blending it into a blender and to a puree, and then spreading that puree to be dehydrated. So that is the deconstruction process. Once the de dehydration has fully taken place, then uh, the reconstruction occurs. And that reconstruction happens by deep frying the cracker into this, uh, to this cracker that you see now <laughs> and to these wafers that you see in this uh, photo. And the thing that is uh, really beautiful about the work Black Monolith X is that it was meant to honor uh, the rebirth of Muhammad Ali and kind of pay homage to the reality uh, that human beings can have multiple lives within a life and can be reborn again. So in that same way, that's true in this piece that's true in Witten's process of rebirth and repurpose. And then that's true in this work as well. Uh, that technique, the three-part technique that honors his tesserae technique also in a way kind of pays homage to his original goal of honoring rebirth and uh, transitions in life that we have. So if you're fortunate enough, we can live more lives than uh, just one. To promote that, that was the promotion. This was the actual event that we had uh, at the BMA. So I got to spotlight three legendary black women chefs in Baltimore. Um, we have Amanda Mack, we have Chef Wemma and Chef Lee. And these women um, all have their own independent businesses here in the Baltimore area. If you're curious about them, you can have my contact at the end. Please reach out. I would love to connect you to them. Um, they definitely need your support right now, especially with all of the uh, changes that the pandemic has thrown our way. But the community, essentially visitors to the museum, got to try all of the different foods of the diaspora that we had on display from West Africa and the Caribbean, again, to the little country in the US. And this is some of the food that we had that evening. Um, all of the events that I do, the majority of the events that I do are free. And I, that is a, that is a key goal of my practice. I, I, that's another reason why I tend to do a lot of events at institutions. There is a there is a accommodation financially to make it sustainable enough to be welcoming and opening to the open to the public. Um, so that is an important element for me. Uh, too often, I feel that food is commodified. So I, I do want to find a way to make it accessible to everyone and show that while there is value in food, that doesn't mean that folks who cannot monetarily pay that value should be denied the experience of enjoying it. Literary works. Um, this is also a key part of my practice. So writing and research is a large part of the work that I do. As I mentioned, you know, I did not go to art school. So a lot of the books that I have at home end up surprisingly enough being 
college textbooks that I didn't realize were college textbooks, but books that were focused on specific things that I wanted to know, like social science, social design, design period, um, food history. So I'm constantly looking for my people in the world. And my people are people who emote through food, people who see food as more than a thing that be consumed and see it as a way to connect with people and change the world. So um, that is oftentimes what centers these literary works that I create. The first one being How to Take Care. So How to Take Care was a digital guide I created in April of this year. Um, for self-care during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so this collaborative guide was created to raise funds for organizations around the world in support of survivors and um, of domestic and intimate partner violence during the pandemic. And the publication raised over $10,000 for those organizations in 30 days, which was mind blowing. Um, this work was inspired by my experience of growing up in a home where there was domestic violence. Um, my sister and I were having a conversation one day at the beginning of COVID and we were thinking about all of the kids at home and thinking about, you know, for some people being home is a great relaxing thing and for others it can be a very stressful, sometimes frightening time and kind of feeling powerless in a way. Um, as an adult, but thinking like, what can I do to support this community? Um, what can I do to support my community? Because I am a part of that community, a community of survivors. So um, this was my way, using food in the form of a, a digital care guide to, um, to help give back and help support them. And it was put out by IAO Studio, which is my design studio in absence of design. Um, so we had a number of different elements. We had a food and drink. There's Dave. <laughs> we had food and drink. Um, we had rituals for sleep hygiene and breathing exercises and poetry. We also had drinks. Um, there were a range of desserts, uh, no, excuse me, a range of recipes and rituals in here with 40 contributors. And you could get the copy for free if you made a donation of $5 or more to any organization around the world. Um, and we had a number of people from around the world who, who donated, um, folks in Malaysia, Singapore, um, India. And actually we had contributors from around the world too. We had Elin D'Souza, she um, is currently uh, social distancing in Goa, India. And then we also had a contributor who is from Oaxaca as well, Oaxaca, Mexico. This uh, got turned into a summer series with Jubilee Arts, <laughs> one of my uh, favorite organizations in Baltimore. We did a how to take care summer series. So it was a virtual summer camp, essentially for the adults, the parents of Jubilee Arts students, which was really amazing. Um, we had four different programs. So poetry for grounding and self-love, resonance breathing with um, Yoko, Yoko, <laughs> local yoga instructor, um, local yoga instructor, Justin Timothy Temple, who was also a How to Take Care contributor, um, sleep hygiene with Felicia, and natural body scrubs with items that you have in your kitchen pantry with me. Um, I'm also, fun fact, a licensed esthetician and have been for the past 10 years going on 11. That was how I also have supported my practice um, up until COVID, as a matter of fact, that was how I was supporting the work that I do. Um, so this was a really great program and to kind of bring a physical element into the virtual series because it can be very exhausting to do a bunch of virtual series um, and also feeling like you don't necessarily get the full effect as an attendee when you're doing something virtually. I reached out to a few local black owned businesses and purchased some of their um, wares to give to the attendees. Um, so if they tied into the work a little bit or tied into the workshop. So for poetry, uh, for grounding and self love, we had notebooks from Drama Mama Bookshop, which are these really beautiful wooden laser cut notebooks so that folks could put their poetry and their journal entries into this book from the workshop. Uh, for the resonance breathing and sleep hygiene, we had lavender vanilla candles from KSM Candle Co., which is another beautiful black owned woman owned business here in Baltimore. Um, and for the natural body scrubs, we had um, I had, it was a cornmeal based body scrub. So 
a cornmeal based, excuse me, face scrub. We did two scrubs. There was a recipe for a sugar scrub and a recipe for a cornmeal facial scrub. And the cornmeal facial scrub, um, I provided the ingredients for that. So they all had little scrub kits so they could make it as we went along and they didn't have to go out and get those ingredients themselves. So it's, it was a really uh, great experience and a cool way to show that you can be physically present in a class uh, with the items that you're learning about. The next publication was PDS, Plow, Dump, Smash. And this was a virtual lunch menu I created for uh, Circa UMBC, which is the Center for Innovation, Research and Creativity in the Arts at UMBC and Black Lunch Table, which is an um, arts archival collective. And PDS was essentially a menu and publication that focused on food waste, agricultural glut during the pandemic and the forgotten history and undervalued sacrifices of people of color who have maintained America's food system over the years. Um, this uh, image on the cover is actually one of the main courses that I served at this lunch. Um, Black Lunch Table, when they do these lunches, which are essentially round tables with artists in the community, local leaders and institutions, um, they do have someone cater their lunches and they do these all around the country. Um, but obviously for this situation, they couldn't have someone cater. So when they reached out to have me cater, we had to kind of figure out how to do it. And we decided to do a virtual menu. Excuse me. So with this virtual menu, um, I focused on the experiences of Chinese immigrants um, when they arrived to the Amer to America, um, and as farmers, um, the work the work that they did as farmers, um, the oppression that they experienced as farmers, um, as far as the terrorism from white Americans and laws that were passed to bar them from owning land um, and having their land revoked. Uh, that they had rightfully bought and given to white farmers. Um, so I talked about that history, the history of Chinese, Amer Chinese immigrants and Chinese Americans in the food system. I also touched on, and that was addressed in this dish here, the main course, beggar's hen. Um, and beggar's hen is actually a dish that is a chicken or hen baked in clay. And I'll show you that in the next slide. Um, for dessert, there was three sisters corn cake. And the three sisters is uh, corn, beans, and squash. And they grow well together. Um, they all support each other in the process and they're commonly grown together in indigenous communities. And with three sisters corn cake, I wanted to kind of show the inter intertwined fates of Blacks in America and indigenous um, Native Americans in this country, how our, our fates have been intertwined. Um, so this was a dish that was made with purple heritage corn, butternut squash and aquafaba whip. Aquafaba is chickpea water. Um, and that is the whip that you see on top here. So then you have the three sisters, you have the corn, the squash, which is pureed into this corn cake and then the whip, uh, which is the bean water. I'm gonna keep going. And this is the chicken. Um, this is the hen that was baked in clay. So I wanted to kind of had a, a fun element for everyone um, while we were at home doing this virtually. Um, I could not supply the ingredients to everyone for this who attended, but when they RSVP, they received the PDF with enough time in between so that if they had the opportunity to do so, they could gather the resources to make um, this dish. Um, and while it seems very crazy and complicated, I promise you it is not. So again, what you're seeing here um, is a remake, um, a, an adaptation of beggar's hen or beggar's chicken, excuse me, which is a traditional Chinese dish that is centuries old where a chicken is wrapped in a lotus leaf, um, stuffed with mushrooms, chestnuts, um, my in particular was stuffed with mushrooms, chestnuts, goji berries, and then baked inside of clay. And this is the same clay that you would use to create ceramics. Um, and it is food safe. So, and it creates a very flavorful, moist chicken. Uh, final element of my practice, objects. 
Uh, much of my object work is wood-based and it consists of wood carvings related to dining. Um, I have taught a few classes on spoon carving at a workshop of our own in Baltimore. And a workshop of our own is a workspace for gender non-conforming people and women who work with wood and other materials. Um, I haven't been in very much in 2021, but or 2020, excuse me, but I hope to get back more in 2021. Um, and here are a few of the things that I have made that I'm most proud of. Um, these are just spoons that I've carved. Spoon carving kind of came as a hobby to me. Um, I love the idea of working with wood just because wood is, even after you cut it down at times, it's still a living thing. Um, the water content in wood when you're carving it and spinning it and turning it on a lathe um, is amazing. Um, there have been plenty of times where I've turned bowls on a lathe and there's water flying everywhere just to show you how much moisture and life is still in uh, this natural raw material. So um, these are different spoons that some functional here and some not necessarily very functional, more artistic um, pieces, but I love, I love carving with wood and also I'm very much inspired by my city <laughs> to carve with wood. This is a salt well inspired by our salt boxes that we have all around the city, which I love very much. This was just a little fun thing that I threw together one night, but um, something that had been sitting in my mind for a while. What if I had a salt well for my table that looked like a salt box? <laughs> so this salt well is actually in my kitchen right now. Um, and just, I love it. It's fun. <laughs> so what's next for me uh, in 2021? So something that I started this fall is Baking for Black Women. And Baking for Black Women was essentially just um, a fundraiser that I've started to kind of get back into baking. I haven't really baked as much since the closing of my bakery in 2017. But um, I launched this Baking for Black Women bake sale to raise funds for Black women in need of a fi financial assistance um, during COVID-19. Um, and so far we have raised $2,000. We have one more coming up. I hope to raise 2,500 um, with the three that we've done or we, me, the three that I've done. <laughs> it's me by myself baking. Um, the next thing is incorporating sound. So I'm very much fascinated by the ways that food and music have been vehicles for storytelling for Black people for centuries. And I want to explore that a little bit more. So um, I actually took classes this uh, fall semester at Peabody Conservatory. Um, to learn how to use Ableton Live software. Um, and this is my, my little keyboard <laughs> um, to incorporate uh, sounds into food pieces. Um, I've kind of started playing with that a little bit more, actually using food as instruments. If you have access to Instagram or if you are familiar with Instagram, I have a few posts on there that show me um, creating and producing beats and also using fruit and vegetables as my instruments. So imagine um, oranges um, being played kind of like a keyboard emitting sounds that I assign to them. So that is the way that this work is evolving at this time. And I'm really excited about how that will um, show up publicly to folks next year. Uh, and also I would like to have more published work. That is something that I would like to have come up more. I had my first poem published this year in Whetstone Journal, which is a food journal, or Whetstone Magazine, excuse me, which is a food journal um, that has really beautiful stories um, from around the world about untold narratives around food um, in the human experience. So I would like to have more poems published in 2021, more of my tablescapes, more essays, more objects. Um, I think that the world would be open to that. I just need to stop being lazy and shy. <laughs> and how can you support the practice? <laughs> so I'm a Patreon creative. I'm a Patreon-based um, artist, creative maker. And currently I have a community of 275 patrons that help make my work sustainable and continuously accessible to the public. Meaning I have 275 people who support my work monthly. Um, they 
just like you would have a Netflix bill. They have a bill that automatically debits uh, money from their account that comes to me that allows me to continue to create work and also uh, make these events that I have been making um, going forward continue to be free. Um, I would also like to have events that aren't necessarily so tied to institutions. Um, but at that time, when I was having them, that was what was more sustainable for me as an artist. Um, but going forward, I would like to have more public events that are um, out in the community, um, freestanding from institutions. And then Patreon allows me to do that. So I'm very thankful for my, my patrons that support my work. Um, and this is where you guys can find me online. I'm on Instagram at Crystal C. Mac. Uh, I have a zine publication that is in the works that will address uh, food apartheid in Baltimore, uh, food access, and our food ways here in the city. Um, and that is called Palette Palette. And it will be coming out in the late winter, early spring of 2021. Um, so you can find out more about that on Instagram at palettepalette.co. And you can keep up with my design studio on, on Instagram at absence of. And this is how you can get in touch with me if you have any questions that you may not have an opportunity to answer or get answered uh, during this Q&A. And that is my website that is very much under construction. So please be patient. <laughs> and that is all that I have to uh, share with you all this evening. I hope I didn't move too quickly through everything, but thank you, JJC, for having me. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you so much for sharing. I see food completely differently now. <laughs> now. <laughs> I really do. I really feel like I'm not really experiencing it. And so I thank you for giving me a different lens through which I can see and experience food. For sure, absolutely. So I, there are some questions in the chat. So um, we're gonna go through a few of those. And then if there aren't any more, people can just come off mute and we can hopefully manage the questions that they ask. But mm -hmm. I do certainly appreciate all of that sharing. I am super fan of, <laughs> of yours. And I do follow you on Instagram. So I saw those oranges making the sounds. <laughs> the oh. <other> <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank um, you. That was quite cool. So let's see. There was a question from Christine on Facebook. She noticed money on the tablescape in Mexico. What was the symbolism of that? Oh, uh, the symbolism of that was essentially capitalism, um, which is a driving tool in the redevelopment of many country, or cities around the world, um, including Oaxaca, including Baltimore, um, and also in a way access as well. You know, currently, and I've said this before many times, um, you know, and I've talked to Dave about this, you can get coffee at Constance Coffee for, or Constance with the nuts and coffee, you can get it for 65 cents. And I don't think that that's going to be a thing going forward in the future, as far as the redevelopment of Baltimore, you know, outside of places like Lexington Market, coffee can be $3, $4, $5. That's not generally accessible to everyone. So I think, for me, that that is what the money symbolized mostly. It symbolized access and uh, capitalism. Okay. One of the other questions was where to get the book. Oh, uh, which book was it? Was it the How to Take Care? Book? How to Take Care? Yvonne, was that the book How to Take Care? Well, <laughs> one thing I was well, Dave knows this. I was actually going to give a copy of How to Take Care to all of the members of JJC. So that's how you can get a book. If you want a book, you got to sign up to become a member of JJC so you can get all these oh. exclusive goodies that they can have access to because that is actually no longer available to the public. Um, oh, nice. If you were to email, you would actually <laughs> that risk auto reply. We got kind of hit with the onslaught after the New York Times article. <laughs> Um, and I had to let people know that it was no longer available, but that will be available to the JJC members. If you sign up, you have to join and it's worth it. You know, if you're interested in the arts and want to invest in the arts, you need to be supporting organizations that support us as artists. Thank you so much for that. Oh, yeah. I'm so grateful for that. So there was another question. Joel asked, how did the chefs react to the cultural and intellectualization of their craft? Did they make the diaspora connections 
And how fin finally, how did the young audience participants respond or question you about your work? As an abstract artist, I really appreciate the collaborative aspects and love the community involvement. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you so much. So um, how did the chefs react? The chefs reacted with joy. They loved it. I'm, I'm guessing that you're asking about Voyage specifically. Um, the chefs loved it because that is actually the food of their culture. Mm -hmm. So Chef Wema is from Ghana. And so she wanted to have the opportunity, you know, oftentimes as a chef, in America period, um, or just as a, an immigrant person in America, you are expected to give up your food culture and kind of embrace what we already have standing um, or to give up elements of your culture um, to have it only be watered down. So she had the opportunity to share food that she loves with people here in Baltimore with ingredients from Ghana. Like her mother bought these ingredients from Ghana. Um, and she used them in food here. So people were getting a real experience. The same with Chef Lee. Chef Lee is a vegan chef, but Chef Lee is from St. Vincent. So she got the opportunity to really show folks like this is what soy-free vegan food made with love looks like. Um, and these are also women who are similar to me when it comes to food and that they like to tell stories through their food as well. So um, it was really like a joy to work with Black women, period, and also just to work with people in food who understand um, that you can take someone on a journey. So they really enjoyed that. And kids were asking all kinds of questions. If you saw in the photos, we had some of the ingredients out. And these were ingredients that aren't really available in grocery stores, even specialty stores, because specialty food stores tend to focus on European ingredients. So they got to see what actual sorghum looked like. They got to see, um, you know, what different types of uh, solidified sugars from the uh, from West Africa look like. So it was just really powerful for people to actually hold these ingredients in their hand and get an understanding of what their ancestors could have potentially eaten and what some folks in the diaspora are still eating today. Um, so yeah. Great. So Dennis says there's a metaphysical or spiritual aspect to this work similar to ministry. Very cool. Thank you, Dennis. <laughs> and then there's that excellent presentation. I'm so proud of the exceptional woman you have become. Love what you did with the citrus on IG, your former chorus teacher. <gasps> <laughs> Okay, okay, that's amazing. Okay, that's a lot of excellent presentation from Sharon Brown. Amazing work. Thank you so much. Really enjoyed the presentation. Yeah. So I, I, there are not, I don't see any more questions in the chat, but I just cannot tell you how much I appreciate you being able to deliver this presentation to us and allowing me to go inside and understand. I just thought, man, she's wonderful. The images are perfect. I mean, there's, yeah. there's something super artly that you don't even see food as something edible. It almost looks, all looks so sculptural. Thank you and so, so much. And so thinking about how you decide where things go, the ingredients to use is really a, an, a spiritual experience, just like the person who said that in the comment. It's, it's very, very thought provoking because you're looking at something that you can almost see the experience in it, if mm. that makes sense to you. That's how I received that, which is what made me keep really following you, even though you had, and, and on IG when you have your conversations about your experience. Yes, <laughs> yes, 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 that's important. <laughs> it's important and because I, I, I love and can appreciate the fact that you're a truth teller in all the work. So, Some folks don't like it, Antoinette. <laughs> but thank you. I mean, no. I, think, I think that's the thing, um, you know, we have, food is a resource and we are fortunate to have it at this time in the ways that we do, especially when we live in a world where people don't have access to it, that could be a few blocks over. So I, I, I feel blessed to be able to eat, but also I feel as though I want to honor the, the journey that this food has made to me. So I want to really kind of tell the full story um, around it. And sometimes that story is ugly. And a lot of people will see that as either, you know, making something out of nothing or, race baiting or sensational sensationalizing something but I think it is important that we confront um the the issues in our food system but also the issues uh that we face day to day as humans and how they are connected you know I, I was having a conversation with someone not long ago I don't think that they 
we were talking about climate change and water and we were discussing how um, I believe and y'all can Google this. I'm not 100 percent, but I believe it takes about 18, 18,000 gallons or 1800 gallons of water to make one pair of jeans. Um, and I don't think that people really understand the ways that our resources are connected to the future that we have. Wow. So that's very powerful. I see. Oh, there is another question. Sierra asks, how do you find structure developing your art practices? Mm. Um, I, I do. I'm not going to lie about that. I do sometimes struggle with that because it is it is very unfortunately there. I don't know very many. I'm finding more now, which is why I love Instagram. It is a great resource and tool in that regard. I'm finding more women, black women specifically, um, Latinx women, Asian women who are working with food in the way that um, I am. I find that people of color, especially women of color, have an understanding um, around the emotional connections and ties to food because oftentimes as you know, we, our ancestors, women in those, these communities, we were feeding people and we do understand the power and importance of food um, and the resources tied to that. So I, I struggle at times having someone to look to, to kind of mentor me in that regard. I, I straddle all these fields. I, you know, I, I don't necessarily work in the food industry any longer, but I also am not necessarily an artist um, that is formally trained. You know, I didn't go to MICA. I didn't do any of those things. So it's, it's been difficult to find my way, but I often find myself looking back to the women that I showed in my presentation. I look back on the work of Ntozaki Shange and I look back on the work of Maya Angelou and Leah Chase. And unfortunately, all of those women and many of the women who I look up to and you know, even wanted to, wanted to meet one day are all gone. You know, we just lost B. Smith last year. So it's been difficult. They have laid a path for me to model um, but in a way, it's kind of like I have to pick up where they left off and kind of make my own. Um, structure has been difficult working from home, especially since my, you know, my studio is at home. But I find that I'm very good at setting boundaries, <laughs> <laughs> maybe too good sometimes. Uh, but I, I find that um, setting boundaries around my time in the way, especially as a Black woman, that I want my work to be presented. Um, as far as whether it's in a gallery or even in a cookbook or anything of that nature. Um, it, it just requires a lot of soul searching personally as far as finding structure for me. Um, I hope that answered the question, Sierra. <laughs> oh, I, I know we're, we're gone, it's 7.43, but I just, I could talk to you all day. And <laughs> I hear you say these words like you're finding your way, yet I, I think you are in the path to whatever that way is. You have created that space. And I don't know anybody doing what you're doing Thanks. in the way that you do it. So finding your way when you already have a place that you have created for yourself and have had people come to that place, mm. that's what pioneers do, right? They make the way for others to get into that groove and you're pulling forward so many people. You said so many words today, I didn't know what they were. And you've introduced <laughs> women that I didn't know. No, this is what this is oh, for. Good. This is to create from your experience in the space in which you work, opportunity for others to learn and grow and connect and see things differently. That's what artists do. That's not training, that's you. That's the DNA from which you come. And that we can all say is, I'm grateful to experience at the end of a year that has been so trying. Mm -hmm. And then to have someone like you, who's such a multidisciplinary artist, creative, to share something so personal, because to even be able to choose ingredients and cook it the way that you did, I mean, for preparation, ceremony, all of those things tie into what somebody gets to live with and lives within them that they've consumed it through your experience they shared with others. And by sharing with us today, I'm so grateful that you were able to have a beautiful presentation, mind you. I mean, you. design is your thing, it's your jam. I mean, it's all these things. I just, I don't know, I don't even know how to close this out because I don't really want to, I'm just being honest. But, but I just, um, 
I don't know if anybody has any other questions, but I adore you and the opportunity to have you come and be with us today. It is a tremendous, I'm Googling people's names, trying to find out how do I get in touch with the sommelier? Let me know the farmers that you've been. No, with, please. All and of that so that we can support. People my email is, work. is the quickest, easiest email is hello at IAO studio <laughs> dot co please send me an email and i will connect you with every person on a document hyperlinked that i talk about <laughs> i'm serious no that is exactly i, I will do what that want to do thank yeah. you so much thank you i so appreciate this i don't know dave gene anybody have any other uh, questions you want to close it out dave the museum crystal thank you so much thank you so much for having me thank you everyone Dave, anything? Would you please repeat the email? Sure. It's hello, H E L L O, at I A O studio dot C O. That is the email, not dot com, dot C O. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. You're Wonderful. And Crystal, is that on your website as well? It is, yes. Okay, because we linked, uh, for everybody watching, we linked Crystal's website on the Facebook event. It is so under construction. You didn't touch that, it is under construction, <laughs> but you can get to Crystal's contact through there. Do Thank we? you, Crystal. Do you have any other questions? Thank you, everyone. Dave, did you All have right. anything? I, I just want to close out by saying, obviously, thank you to the incredible Crystal. It's a, oh. always a pleasure. I, oh, he's wonderful. I think Norma has something to say. Norma? Norma's on mute. Oh, Norma, you're on mute. You're on mute. I, I just Norma. Uh, when you when we, when you go back to business for five minutes, that's when I'll have a question. Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so folks, everybody watching, thank you for chiming in. Crystal, thank you so much for your work tonight. As uh, we spoke about earlier, if you want to support Crystal directly, uh, get in contact with her, her Patreon, um, through all the folks that support her and everything that she does. Uh, she's able to bless us with everything that she puts out into this world. And then also with JJC, uh, we are celebrating a 35th anniversary. Many of you may just be learning about what we are doing. But uh, the JJC has been a part of the BMA for a very long time and has been doing this work for a very long time. Uh, you can support us in our fundraising uh, drive that we are just embarking on by going to artbma.org slash give join. Um, and also we found out tonight that if you become a member, uh, you will get how to take care, which is a really amazing um, collection of, of recipes and and tips of how we managed to make it through this year from crystal so, and dave what the i said and dave there's a recipe from dave in there on stuffed grape leaves i did contribute my sitos recipe for grape leaves <laughs> that got that got us through the pandemic for sure um i think we're all wrapped up again folks uh join us january 14th Thursday, 6.30, we're going to be hearing from Ernest Shaw for the start of our uh, 2021 JJC Talk Speaker Series. Norma has her hand raised. Yes, Norma. If you're talking, you're on mute. You're on mute. Okay, I unmuted you. Yes, Norma, what were you okay. saying? Uh, the Joshua Johnson Council pledge of when we get the solicitation for the annual fund, which I got this week, can we designate if it's for the Joshua Johnson Council pledge or should that go in, in a different way? Uh, let's cut off from.